Hello and welcome to that Dory B. Ever wake up and find yourself dead? No? Okay then. Let's go back to the year 2007, when I wasn't even a fetus yet and Square Enix was busy creating their next game, The World Ends With You. The game was actually created by the same team as Kingdom Hearts, which I haven't played so let's move on. However, Square Enix wanted to distance this game from anything else they've made before, and what better place to do that than the Nintendo DS? also known as Gimmick Central, and with the console chosen they proceeded to start making, in their words, a game that could only be played on the DS, and on July the 27th, 2007 they did that by launching the game It's a Wonderful World in Japan. Yeah, quite a name difference between the Japanese and international versions. Anyway, this game is definitely for the DS and only for the DS, which is the reason why they released a mobile version a few years later, and a Switch port, and an anime and a sequel, and a yeah, the game was eventually ported to mobile in 2012 and is actually still available on the App Store. Now the version that I'll be playing is the World Ends With You final remix for the Nintendo Switch, which is basically the mobile version but in HD and with Switch controls, but enough waffling, let's get into the game. So as you can see, we start in a city. Out of my face. You, you what? Shut up. But I didn't even say anything. Just go the hell away. You know what? Fine. Never even liked you anyway. Yeah, our main character here has a very severe case of emo, which is a very good first impression. Well done. Now, as I was saying, we end up in a city with our character here not knowing why or where he is. The character starts hearing voices in his head, which are revealed to be other people's thoughts. He then gets a ring from his phone, which can only mean one thing. The debt collectors. They found me. The message ends up being from these guys called the Reapers, threatening to erase you if you don't go to this place called 104. Our character merely fobs it off as spam, that is, until his hand turns into a timer and a bunch of frogs start to trying to attack him. Now, it may shock you to know that this is in fact a symptom of a rare disease known as Ohio, so he should be fine. After this, the still unnamed character runs away from basically every spoiler in the entire game, until he meets this very full-on person who he makes a pact with. We're also introduced to the game's combat system, which basically works by using these pins to all the enemies. Now since it's the Switch, the game can be played in two ways, on the TV with Joy-Cons or on the console with the touchscreen. The TV mode uses your Joy-Cons much like a Wii remote to drag your character and use pins, and the handheld version gives you arthritis 30 years early. The handheld way to play is largely based on the original DS version of playing the game, and was actually the way I first beat the game, but trust me, it wears out your hands very quickly. Anyway, we get into a conversation with your new partner, called Shiki, about some mysterious Reapers game, but our character decides he doesn't want to speak more than 10 words to Today, so he runs off. Shiki catches up and it turns out you and Shiki are both part of the game mentioned previously, and if you don't survive the full week, you get erased, or to put it more bluntly, killed. This explains a lot, especially about the pin that can read people's minds and the random timer that appeared a while ago. The junk mail that was sent by those farmers a while ago is apparently the mission that pe the people playing the game have to complete. Now the cool thing about this is that if you don't complete the mission, you literally die, which opens up a bunch of opportunities. Like the mission could just be buy me a million dollar mansion and the players can really do otherwise. Okay, a full 9 minutes into the game and we finally get told that our main character's name is Neku, which kinda sounds like a Pokemon. So Neku and Shiki try to go to 104 to complete their task but it turns out there's some random invisible wall in the way. After this, some random guy in a red hoodie opens up the wall because, yes, and they manage to get through. You make it to 104 and then some frogs happen again, however you now have access to your partner in combat, which you can use similarly to a normal pin. Oh yeah, did I mention that this game probably has one of the best soundtracks out there in a video game? Like, most of the lyrics mean absolutely nothing, but if anything that adds to the experience. Anyway, you end up killing a few more frogs and some bear thing, then you wake up in an alleyway the next day. Nope, not sketchy at all. What's better, you can't get out of it because one of those invisible walls is in the way. Next, guy in red hoodie from yesterday comes up to you, tells you to erase some noise, refuses to elaborate further, then stands in a corner until you do something. You also get introduced to a lot more pins that you can try out and use, such as a lightning bolt, a beam, or a hand. There's also something called the player pin that you have two of for some reason that makes you able to read people's minds. Anyway, once you finish committing frog genocide, you can move over to the next area, where you meet Beat and Rhyme, another pair of players. They tell you a bit about using your phone, Neku emos, Beat and Rhyme leave, and you start to look for a cursed statue that is mentioned in the mission mail. You end up finding the statue of Heichiko, which actually exists in real life, then you start polishing it to get rid of the curse. No, still a war criminal. 
Anyway, it turns out there's a literal pack of wolves hiding in the statue, because that's just how things work. Once you deal with these, however, some reaper shows up and starts demanding ramen, because everyone knows you can't kill people on an empty stomach. Speaking of killing people, that's exactly what Neku does to Shiki once the reaper promises a way out of the game. Anyway, you wake up once again, only this time in some dark room. Furthermore, it turns out that Shiki didn't actually die, and the game flashes back to the day before. So, Neku's doing his whole strangling partner with blue circles shtick when this absolute chad called Mr. Hanakoma shows up and just tells the reaper to stop, and she does. Again, absolute chad. So, the mission of day 3 is to defeat the monster of A East, which is some concert space that Shiki frequents. Apparently not frequent enough to realise they were in said concert space the whole time though. Alright, so once Shiki finishes growing an extra pair of limbs, you go and speak to punk phoenix right over here who gets you to go on some quest to find this technician to fix the lights. Oh looky here, it's another Hanakoma flashback where you learn a bit more about the game. Turns out the guy in red hoodie from before is also a reaper, just a different sort that doesn't outright attack players. Furthermore, it's revealed that everyone involved in the game exists in an alternate Shibuya called the Underground, or the UG for short, that physically exists in the same place as real Shibuya, but people living in the real Shibuya can't see people in the UG. Simple. There's also some guy called the Composer, who's basically God that runs the game. After this, you get given something called the sync pin that you can use once Neku and Shiki sync their attacks a set number of times. You tap the sync button in the top right of your screen, which initiates some sort of card game. I'm now in a field, so I can actually see this non backlit screen. Basically, just another card game, i.e., a game that I've never played in my life. But then you realise almost all of them are card games. But again. Basically, you briefly get shown a few cards and you have to match which one's which, and the more cards you match, the higher damage the attack created will do. Anyway, you very quickly find the technician in a ramen shop down the road, and it turns out he's actually possessed by noise and you have to fight the noise off in order to progress. Once you fight off the noise, the guy returns to his senses and goes over to A East, only to forget what he was getting. This means that, surprise surprise, you have to find out for him. Beat and Rhyme also show up and start going on about memes. Don't worry, the game's from 2007 when memes were just a fancy word for ideas instead of, you know. Anyway, you get given a few memes to try and imprint on people, which basically involves injecting a thought into someone else's mind. Hmm. Of course, human sacrifice. After a very roundabout task of imprinting thoughts into this guy, he finally realises he needs to buy a fuse. He does, and then you're free to beat the Master of A East, this bat thing. Basically, the bat is invincible until you get Shiki to destroy some red stuff on top, which wants the lights to turn back on and leaves you able to fight the bat. The mechanics of the battle are a bit weird, but once you get used to them, you can pretty easily beat the boss. Or not, as the countdown timer is still ticking even once you finish the task, which means that the bat wasn't actually the master. Luckily enough though, Beat and Rhyme found the actual master, which was some tiny golden bat in the corner, and promptly killed it. Also, it turns out that our favourite punk attorney is actually also a reaper, and shouting at technicians is just kind of like a side hobby. We also get an extra special sneak peek at the reaper's underground bar, and also the, the week's game master, basically the guy who sets all the missions. Speaking of missions, the day 4 mission gets released to the players, and it's suspiciously easy. It's just reaching a record shop with no time limit. We also get introduced to clothing, which you can buy from stores around the city. They increase stats such as your attack, defense, and HP, but you won't actually catch Neku wearing them, as he's physically unable to change out of his purple hoodie, headphones, and iPod shuffle. Thinking about it, do we actually know what Neku's listening to all the time? It could be a podcast, the music that's playing in battle, who knows? He could even be listening to... John and the Johnettes! Previous psychology. What's that? <laughs> anyway, you make it to the record store and then Rhyme gets eaten by a shark. Nice going. It turns out to be a trap laid by this pair of reapers, who send out more noise afterwards to finish you off. By this point, however, you can start collecting other pins from either shops or battles, such as this one that rains boulders or this one that sends a line of shocks whichever way you swipe. These pins can also evolve and level up in terms of attack, which makes battles a lot easier. After you beat the first round of noise, Beat plans on killing the one that killed Rhyme, that is, until Hanakoma shows up and tells them he literally can't fight the noise without a partner. Kinda ruins Beat's ultimate plan for revenge, but that's just what happens in the world of fighting frogs and sharks. After a bit of routine Shiki calling Neku inhuman, we end day 4 and get given the mission for day 5, set Spain Hill free from the noise. You try to complete the missions by simply just killing noise, but clearly that doesn't work, and the noise instead is referring to these two people over here. You try clearing noise around them as well, but that also doesn't work. Since both of these don't work, we turn to the best solution out there, Divine Intervention, also known as a piece of paper and a few coins. This is called Reaper Creeper, some trend where you put a coin on a piece of paper and base your life choices on it. 
So you basically manipulate the coin using telepathy to change the outcome of the game, because you can do that now apparently, and then the stuff the person does changes accordingly. Now the girl on the left here suspects that the other girl on the right is going out with her crush, and it's up to you to move the coin to uncover the truth. Um, so, hi, it's Editing Dari here, and, like, I just realised the stuff that I wrote here makes absolutely no sense at all. It's just some boring thing about a relationship anyway, and, like, uh, no, Reaper Creep or whatever. You don't need to know this, um, so I'm just gonna skip it. Okay, bye. And immediately after that brief, wholesome moment, we get brought right back into the action, with the literal game master and Michelin star chef, Higashi Siwa, showing up and summoning some noise for you to fight. After that, Higashisiwa sends a bunch of random ingredient metaphors for jealousy at Shiki, and you get told a whole five days into the game that you're actually dead, and the game is a competition to come back to life. Of course, you can't remember how you died, because, you know, amnesia. But at least you know that you did. Anyway, it's day six and you randomly wake up with this red pin, but that doesn't really seem to do anything other than slow you down. You also get your mission mail for the day, dominate the scramble crossing view at three o'clock, as well as an overly quiet Shiki. Pretty strange day, but could you really classify any other day in this game as normal? Anyway, we find this guy here, a businessman called Makoto who's trying to promote the pin you got given at the start of the day. Anyway, things start to make a bit more sense at this point, with the view referring to some advert screen at the Scramble Crossing, and your task is to make people watch the advert for the red pin at 3 o'clock. So Makoto's first method is to give out free samples, with a few epic taglines to go with them. So we've got, Unreal bro, totally gnarly. C come and get some hot stuff. Yeah, I think we're done here. So, with taglines in hand, Makoto starts handing out the total of three pins before declaring himself a fashion icon, and it's at this point I realise Makoto might not be the best way to finish this task. Anyway, Shiki runs off midway through the task to contemplate why she's even here, and you have to run off to try and work out what she means. Partway through a cryptic monologue about how subpar she is, you see a literal exact copy of Shiki chatting in the RG, which causes dead Shiki to freak and run off. You catch up with her again, and she finally tells you what her entry fee was, her appearance. You see, every player upon joining the game had to give up what was most important, and for Shiki, it turned out to be her appearance. Furthermore, it turns out that she was actually using Eri's body, a friend from the RG that you just saw a minute ago. Confused yet? Good, because Makoto's screams of despair quickly break up the conversation before it gets too meta. So, since Makoto's slang of the times didn't work, you have to find a different way to complete the task, and that just happens to be wearing the pins in battle. Apparently, if you wear pins from a certain brand in battle enough, it will change the trend for that area, and make said brand more popular, and sure enough, it does, with the advert showing soon after. So, that works somehow, and Shiki goes back to stalking her friend. However, she hears Eri talking about how much she misses Shiki, which gives her enough motivation to keep on going. We also get a clip of Beat talking to himself, and Mr. Hanakoma talking to himself, and that's it for the day. And with that, you end up on the last day of the week, with the task of defeating the Game Master on the freeway. Before approaching the final boss, I stopped off at a few shops to get some upgraded clothes, and fought some bird mini-boss who drops cars on you. We also get a cutscene of Beat confronting the Reapers about something, then we're free to head on to the boss, Higashi Siwa. So it basically turns into some giant ram that you have to fight, but luckily for the most part this battle's pretty straightforward. In the first phase it's practically impossible to die since his only attack is firing a few electric shocks at you that you can pretty easily avoid. However, the second phase is a lot more demanding than the first, with him constantly mincing and pounding you once every few seconds. Once you get the hang of it, however, it's pretty easy to complete. So once you finish destroying Chef Ramsey's reputation, you say your final goodbyes to the UG and get transported into the world of the living. Yeah, as if. Yeah, so the game didn't finish as previously advertised, and instead you get sent right back to square one for a second week in the game. Fun. So, you go back to the statue of Heichiko to find a new partner, when you randomly instantly become partnered with this guy, because logic. He introduces himself as Yoshia Kiryu, or Joshua for short, and said that he just helped himself to the strongest partner. What's weirder is that you can actually scan him, which isn't the case for any other player, and when you do, some random backstreet in Shibuya shows up. Confused yet? He also works out the somewhat cryptic mission mail for you as going to 104. So the way Joshua's attacks in game works are slightly different to Shiki's. With Shiki, you press the enemy to attack, whereas with Josh, you swipe downwards to send stuff falling onto the noise, using his epic phone powers. Die! The sync attack also works slightly differently this time round, with you having to click the cards from 1 to 3, avoiding mirrored ones. So you head off to 104, but once you get there, you find some massive junk heap, just there. 
Accompanying the junkie, however, we have one Shomen Imamoto, the GM for the week and massive maths nerd. He goes on a bit of a ramble about how so zeta slow we are and summons a bit of noise for us to fight. You beat the noise, deal with Joshua Joshua-ing, and that's it. Weird day, no? So it's day two, and by the time you wake up, Joshua's already on the phone to someone, somehow. Anyway, Neku decides to scan him again, and this time something slightly disturbing shows up. In addition to the regular Shibuya alleyway, we get a literal passed out Neku on the floor, with a player pin on his jacket. This causes Neku to freak out, obviously, but of course the mission mail cuts him off before he can really act on anything. We also get a cutscene of what happened directly after the events of the first week, with Neku and Shiki in a bright room along with B and the conductor of the Reapers, Megumi Kitaniji. However, Kitaniji tells the players that only one of the players that finished the game can actually come back to life, per the composer's request. Furthermore, B actually converts to the Reapers for some reason, which leaves just Neku and Shiki with the composer. Also, for some reason, Shiki is actually the one that collected the most points during the week, which means Shiki managed to return, and Neku was left with no choice but to play the game a second week. It's also revealed that Neku's memories were his entry fee, and they were returned to him afterwards. That is, apart from how he died, which Kitaniji claimed to not to have taken. Since Neku decided to play for a second week, he also had a second entry fee taken, and that just happened to be Shiki. Anyway, after a bit of Josh not caring at all what Neku just told him, the two start to figure out what the mission actually means. Since Zeta Junkheap Man is in charge of the missions, they're all incredibly cryptic. Day 2's reads basically the same as Elon Musk's kid's name. Ignoring the fact that Neku just knows the square root of 3 off by heart, they eventually work out that it's referring to a gold pin on Route 3 of Shibuya. For some reason, Josh knows exactly where this is, and you head off. However, on the way there, a strange strange type of noise confronts Neku and Josh, which you can only take a good amount of damage on you if you sync your attacks together. Not to mention that that shouldn't even be possible since your pack usually prevents random noise attacking you. Anyway, you make it to Route 3 and it turns out to be the place of a Tin Pin Slammer competition, of which the gold pin is the prize. Now the premise for Tin Pin Slammer is pretty simple, slam your pins into your opponent's pins until it falls off the stage. There's also a few special attacks and that's about it. Yeah, it's not exactly the most complex system in the world, especially compared to the World Ends with Use normal battle system. Them, but I'm not complaining. So you beat this guy here before heading on to the strongest tin pin slammer, this kid who you actually helped advertise pins to to the week before. However, the second the match begins you instantly get beaten due to this guy's weird rocket thing that he uses to eject pins. Like come on, how is that even legal? However, very luckily another player won the battle against Rocket Kid due to some malfunction and you're off the hook from Erasure. Josh also reveals that he was the reason the kid's ejecting thing didn't work, to make a point that any other players could complete the mission, not just Neku. I swear this game does everything in its power to make you want to throw Josh into an active volcano, but he just has to stick around, because that's just the way things are. Oh look, it's another one of Zeta Man's works of art, and that means... Yep, there he is. We also get a look at Reaper Beat, now with 100% more wing, getting orders to erase us. Yep, that's not concerning at all. And already it's day three, Josh is on the phone again to who knows who, and Neku's busy waiting for the mission mail, which is taking a lot longer to arrive than usual. Anyway, Josh gets off his phone and reads out the mission mail. Proceed to Cat Street in 15 minutes. So, since Cat Street's on the other side of Shibuya, Josh and Neku both become Olympic runners and run the whole of Shibuya in less than 15 minutes. That is, until they get to Cat Street and Neku realises there was never any mission mail at all, and it was all a ruse by Josh. You see, Josh had been wanting to visit some place for the last day or two, and since Neku's so focused on finishing the missions, Josh decided to disguise his endeavours as a mission with a deadline, because that's just the way Josh does things. Anyway, you head over to the cafe that Josh wanted to go to, and it turns out that it's actually Mr. Hanakoma's cafe that he mentioned in week one. It's also explained that the guy that Josh was on the phone to yesterday and today was also Mr. Hanakoma, and they seem to know each other quite well. So you have another chat with Mr. H about stuff, and he tells you a bit about Josh and how he knows so much about the game. Turns out that Josh could actually see the UG back before this week's game, and he went to Mr. Hanakoma for answers. He also upgraded both you and Josh's phones to pick up energy spikes for some reason. Listen up, phones. The world ends with you. Oh, there we go. Roll credits. Anyway, you start walking back to the scramble when you get approached by the all-new Reaper Beat and get sent into a battle with him. This is actually the first time you fight just a Reaper on its own, unless you're counting the Game Master, as opposed to fighting noise that the Reaper spawns. The thing about this battle, though, is that you don't actually have to erase all of his health bar to exit the battle. He has so much HP that Neku and Joshua just decide to give up part way through. You also find some brand new ramen shop in Dogenzaka with a massive Q trickling out of it, which seems to be the thing that Josh's tracker is responding to. Basically, you have to help this guy in another ramen shop down the road come up with something that will take business away from the new one, and of course the way to do that is through another round of imprinting. Hmm. Of course, tactical nukes. 
Before you do that, however, you realise the guy running the new ramen business is actually the same guy who you helped promote the pins in week one, you know, with all the epic taglines and whatnot. Anyway, you get to finding a few memes to imprint on the ramen shop owner, such as a dessert ramen suggested by this girl here. You suggest the dessert ramen and he makes it, but something still seems to be missing. You also come across the promoter of the new ramen bar himself, some popular blogger called The Prince, who's arguing with the owner about what he wrote on his blog. Turns out that all he really wants is a basic ramen without any fancy extras so you imprint that back to the other ramen owner, and surprise surprise it actually works. What's even better, that blogger from before actually comes into the shop, tries it, and I quote, F's it to high heaven. Don't worry, F actually stands for fabulous, according to the blogger at least. Anyway, the other ramen slash promoter guy shows up, and that's when the prince decides to stop promoting the other guy and start promoting Sebastian's ramen instead. Now, you may be asking what importance this has to the game at all. Yeah, in terms of days in The World Ends With You, this would definitely be a bit filler, but you know what, I kinda like the Great Ramen Expedition that we got forced into. Now, I mean, some people could say that this day was actually a deep and meaningful metaphor about sticking to what you think is best and not based on the trends, but guess what, I'm not some people. Anyway, it's day four and we enter with Josh and Neku playing Tin Pin for, for some reason. And wait, how are they even playing Tin Pin? Do tables exist in the UG that people can't see as well? Anyway, we get some more Reaper Bar footage, and this time it's Kitaniji as well as someone called Konishi talking about some taboo noise that seems to be attacking Reapers. Meanwhile, at the scramble, Josh is talking about jacking Shibuya and finding the Shibuya River, whatever that means. Also, the signal today is coming from the Udagawa back streets, which funnily enough was the same place that Josh had in his head, as well as Neku dead on the floor. So you head off to the back streets, but on the way there you get stopped by the punk attorney himself, and he locks the path to Udagawa so you have to help him. So basically, him and his band have lost their microphone and you have to go and find it. So you go on some random investigation thing to find where the microphone went, and I'll save the details for you, but basically you get sent to this phone box where you can use another new feature on your phone, the camera. Basically, you can take three photos a day of different times in the past, because apparently Mr. Hanakoma can just program that into your phone. So you take a few photos, bring them back to the band and work things out based on them. You also notice that everyone seems to be wearing those red pins that you were promoting a while back. Josh also tells you a bit more about Reapers and how they can materialise at will into the RG, just without their powers and wings. Anyway, you go back to the band and recap all of the information that I just skimmed over. So basically this guy Tenho stole the mic to stop the other members of the band from fighting about who should do vocals, but he left his mobile phone in the phone booth where he also left the microphone. By the time he got back, however, the mic was gone and some megaphone was in its place. Now, if you just cast your memory back to when Minamimoto was shouting some random number phrases at you on day two, what was that? Oh look, a megaphone! So yeah, Minamimoto found the microphone and put the megaphone in its place as a trade, then used the microphone as part of one of his random junk heaps he builds around the city. So with that sorted and the band scrounging through some junk heap, you're free to go on, at least until Beat shows up again and starts fighting you, in the exact same way as before, before the game kicks you out of the battle in the exact same way before, and then Beat disappears in the exact same way as yeah, you get the gist. However, while fighting you, he actually dropped the pendant that Rhyme used to own, and Neku plans to give it back the next time they predictably meet. So you arrive at Udagawa, Josh does a bit of monologuing, Neku does a bit of fanboying for this artist called Cat, and you head over to the mural that the sign is picking up. As well as finding the mural, you also find the Zeta man himself, Minamimoto. However, he leaves without noticing you, and then almost immediately after, Reaper Team Rocket show up and notice that the mural's actually a sigil for taboo noise, the type of noise that attacks Reapers and are practically invincible unless you sink your attacks. Josh also says something about deja vu from Neku spacing out, so you decide to scan him one more time just to be sure. Upon scanning him, you get the same clip of Udagawa, however this time it actually shows Neku looking at Cat's graffiti, and before you know it, there's Josh with a gun staring straight at Neku, and I don't think I have to spell out what happened next. So, it turns out that you're actually partnered with your killer, that's fun. So, welcome to day 5, your killer slash partner is on the phone to some barista who's also guardian for the game, and Neku's literally playing the game for someone's life. Who says this storyline is convoluted? Anyway, Josh finally explains what jacking Shibuya actually means, to overthrow the composer. So, simply put, they've been running around Shibuya for the past two days looking for basically God. So, you head off back to Mr. Hanakoma's coffee shop to get your tracker fixed, but that pair of reapers decided to block off the next few roads for whatever reason. 
But the challenges to get through the walls are all pretty simple. Make this brand number one in the trends, buy me some ramen, answer some questions, wear all clothes from a particular brand, etc. There's also this one here where you have to fight some noise using the pins the Reaper picks out for you, which is a bit of a pain since you don't actually get told how to use them. After a bit of randomly swiping around the screen, you can work out how yourself, but it's still a bit strange. So you make it to the coffee shop, Mr. H goes and fixes the tracker, and Josh talks about that weird ability to see the UG that Hanakoma mentioned earlier. Neku also almost manages to confront Josh about, you know, the whole getting killed by him thing, but Hanakoma very conveniently finishes fixing the tracker just as he is doing so. Josh also asks Neku how he died, which he avoids properly answering. Neku asks the same thing back, but of course Josh doesn't answer, because he's, well, Josh. So they start heading down to where the signal's coming from, but guess what happens? Is the answer A, Azuki and Carrier sending out noise? Is it B, B trying to come and stop you? Or is it C, Minamoto with his Zeta talk? And your time is up. The correct answer is... Of course it's B. Uzuki and Carrier are actually right behind him though, concerned that he's directly attacking players instead of sending out noise. Beat responds to that by explaining he's doing some sort of special op for the conductor, meaning that he can attack players directly. Azuki isn't the most pleased about this, but they manage to suck it up and go away, which leaves Beat to do his thing of attacking the exact same way for the exact same amount of time as ever. So, after you get kicked out of the battle as usual, you give Rhyme's pendant that you were holding on to from last time back, and Beat storms off. Anyway, whilst walking over to where the signal is, Josh actually reveals that the graphic designer that Neku fanboys over, Cat, was actually Mr. Hanakoma all along. I mean, it wasn't that hard to put together the pieces, with his cafe being on Cat Street, and his cafe being called Wildcat, and him literally saying word for word Cat's motto at once point, but still. So they head over to the station underpass, which is where the signal came from, and see that the path is blocked by a wall. This type of wall, however, is very visible, unlike the ones that the Reapers have set in the past. So, with no way forward, you decide to head back, but get stopped by a taboo noise that you have to fight. You beat it, but even more sharp, so Josh decides to summon some massive beam of light which instantly kills it, because, you know, he can just do that. Anyway, Carrier just randomly comes out of the shadows and tells us that Josh is actually alive, since the sheer power from that beam of light simply can't be done if you're dead. Of course, this angers Neku even more than he already is, knowing the fact that Josh is basically just playing the game for fun. In fact, it actually angers him to the point where he actually accuses Josh out loud of killing him, which he promised himself he wouldn't until day 7. What if I am the one who killed you? You're gonna do something about it? Well done, Square Enix. You've created the first ever character that I want to reach into the screen and strangle. So, on that cheery note, the day ends, we've reached day six, and Josh is doing guess what? He's on the phone. Crazily enough, you actually have a mission today, and it's as cryptic as ever. It's also the light show attack thing that Josh did the day before replaced his older attacking game, which means it's a lot more helpful in battle. There's also a lot less roads open than usual, which makes your path a lot more linear than usual. Anyway, the basic premise for today is getting used to fighting more taboo noise, and you also manage to work out what the mission actually means. Put simply, you have to go to Udagawa to fight some boss. On the way, you also come across the Reaper duo getting harassed by taboo noise, and Neku decided to help them specifically because they'll hate it. And he's right, they do. So you make it to Udagoa, but beat the taboo noise, Zeta Man makes an appearance, and that's it for the day. Pretty short, but maybe that's a blessing based on how long the rest of the week is. Anyway, day 7 has already rolled around, and so is the mission mail. Erase the game master at Pork City. A bit straightforward for the Zetmeister, but never mind. So, Pork City is basically a skyscraper split into a few levels, with Minamoto on the top. Furthermore, you can only use a certain type of pin for each level. Try anything else and it's crossed out and you can't use it. The first level is Must Rattus only, which basically meant that I didn't have to change anything, since most of my attack pins were Must Rattus already. The second level was a bit more annoying, being D&B only, which I barely use at all, but I managed. So, after completing both of the floors, you can make your way up to the roof, where you approach Minamimoto. He seems a bit confused while you're here in the first place, which is strange. He then proceeds to talk about some last time in a reenactment. Then Neku gets the same flashback he's been getting for the past week, but with a bit more added on. It shows that the shot Joshua fired wasn't actually directed at him, but rather one Minamimoto who just happened to be behind him. After this, we see that it wasn't actually Josh that shot Neku, but rather Minamimoto himself. He then fobs off the literal killing of someone as insignificant before initiating the boss battle. The first phase of the battle consists of Zeta Man floating in the air whilst he spawns taboo noise that you have to fight on the floor. 
After this, he becomes attackable and basically just teleports around the map a load. There's also a few taboo noise on the floor at the same time, but as long as you avoid them, they don't pose much of a problem. I say the main saving grace in this fight for me was the Splish Splash Barrier pin, which basically let me regain health whenever I wanted to, provided it wasn't charging up. Anyway, after you deal enough damage, Minamamoto turns into a taboo noise, and my technique for this phase was basically try to stay alive until he turns back into a normal human. Anyway, I basically repeated this until I'd fully taken away all of his health, and then the battle was over. I will say I found this battle a lot easier compared to the week 1 battle, it might just be due to my better pins, but I didn't die once in this battle. Anyway, after you beat him, he starts laughing manically, recites Pi, then says, the world's made up of numbers. Ah, oh, you've said it wrong, it's actually, it's just ones and zeros, you should really know better, honestly. Anyway, Minamamoto summons something called a level eye flare, and Josh literally sacrifices himself to save you. You know what, this has all happened really quickly, so here's a fish spinning to the pig noise theme while you recover. So, with that sorted, guess what happens? Yep, you wake up with a scramble for a third week of the game with absolutely no explanation whatsoever. You once again get the mission mail, reaching 104 once again, and Neku once again goes to Heichko to try to find a new partner. However, strangely enough, there's literally nobody at 104 to make a pact with, and this is confirmed when Neku gets another message, this time reading, P.S. This game only has one player. Best of luck. Now, that basically means that Neku can't fight any noise or, heck, do anything. This means that when a few frogs appear in front of Neku, he literally can't do anything apart from run. What's worse is he's surrounded by noise and is about to throw in the towel, that is until Beat appears out of nowhere, a metaphor flies completely over his head, and then he forms a pact with Neku, saving him from absolute defeat. Now, as usual, Beat's attack style is completely different from both Shiki and Josh's. Beats works by dragging your cursor along the floor to slide his skateboard into enemies. His sync is also fairly different, this time you have to match cards together by removing ones that don't. So Beat explains how he made a pact with Neku since he gave Rhyme's pendant back the week before, and how being a reaper didn't really suit him. We also get a complimentary flashback to the end of last week's game, with Kitaniji congratulating Neku for being the only player to survive the week. He also reveals that he was the one who sent the mission mail to defeat Minamoto, since he was sending taboo noise to the reapers. This explains why he was so confused when you were literally just completing the mission. Also, as punishment for working with Joshua who was illegally taking part of the game, you also got entered into the game a third and final time. Anyway, Beat does a bit of not paying attention to the mission at all and going to the station underpass instead, breaks a wall by punching it, tries to break another wall by punching it, fails, etc. He explains that Reapers get given key pins to open, or in Beat's case, punch certain areas, but that his key pin doesn't seem to open the wall to the Shibuya River, which is where he seemed to be going. Anyway, since you don't have the right key pin, you go back and, you know, complete the mission you were given in the first place. So, you make it to 104, and B explains his plan to overtake the composer, because that's just the cool new thing to do, I guess. We also get a clip of Kitaniji telling the new GM to put the UG on something called Emergency Call. We don't get told exactly what this is yet, but it sounds kind of important. Anyway, we get to day 2, and Neku and B are almost instantly greeted by the new GM, Mitsuki Konishi, or the Iron Maiden. She basically shows up, tells Beat that he only has 5 days to live, takes his entry fee, some noise sitting on his shoulder, and turns it into a pin. She also gives the two their mission, defeat her in the next six days. This basically prompts a six day goose chase to find this GM, so buckle up for probably the strangest week of the game you'll experience. Speaking of strange, the O-pins that all Reapers are now required to wear look suspiciously similar to the ones you had to promote all the way back in week one. So your game of hide and seek with the GM is made a lot easier since she forgot to take Beat's key pin from him, which means he can still open some walls. You also get approached by some Reaper who tells you about the emergency call that was mentioned in a cutscene previously. Basically, when things get really dire, something called Emergency Call happens, which basically means all Reapers can attack players directly. Not that the Reapers are very powerful at all, they barely attack, and the noise is honestly more of a challenge. So you end up at A East, and Beast and Neku assume that's where she's hiding. Of course, Punk Jackson makes an appearance, but this time he actually attacks you instead of sending on some random round trip to find some microphone or a technician. He also calls Beat by his full name, Daizu Kenojo Bito, which really annoys Daizu- sorry, Beat over here. So you do the whole battle sequence thing you've done a billion times before, 
fall, then Raito here gives you a high level keep in which gives you access to a bit more of Shibuya. Anyway, he heads inside the building only to be erased almost immediately after. Anyway, inside Ace, there's basically the same bat boss from week 1, just a bit more powerful. Yeah, there's not much to comment about this boss besides one extra added attack which sends Wave to paralyze you. Anyway, once you beat the boss, the day ends and you're back at the scramble once again. Now this time we have Azuki here to deal with and she sets up some game that in which we win, we get the pin that Kanishi took from Beat as a Zen trophy on day 2. So of course Beat decides to sneeze the exact same moment Azuki told us what to do, so he decides to make something up about how the mission is about Reaper Creeper instead. So you go around Shibuya rigging people's Reaper Creeper games because that's definitely what we're supposed to do. We also come across Makoto from the ramen shop and the taglines that I don't want to talk about, and I actually ended up convincing the boss not to use Reaper Creeper, which may be the exact opposite of what Beat said to do, but whatever. He also tells us, two and a bit weeks after you first met him, that Ryan was actually his sister, which I kind of already assumed, but it was never actually brought to attention in the game. It's also revealed that the noise on Beat's shoulder from the other day that got turned into a pin is actually Ryan. Yeah, it's a bit strange to have a human just in a pin, but so is everything in this game. By this point I actually found out that Azuki actually set a mission for us, but luckily we didn't have to wait long until she made an angered appearance and told us that the mission was actually tag all along, and, and as expected, not Reaper Creeper. Anyway, Neku tags Azuki mid rant, which you bet set her into a battle sequence. Luckily for us, the battle is extremely easy since you can basically spam attacks with left and right without her doing much at all in terms of defence. Anyway, once you beat her in battle, Carrier shows up and gives you a level 3 key pin as well as a challenge to beat him in exchange for the rhyme pin. You'll have to wait until day 4 however, since the day very abruptly ends and you wake up in an underpass along with a very on edge beat. All of your key pins also randomly disappeared and there's also a few boxes on the floor with symbols on them. There's also a few pieces of paper on the floor with matching symbols to the boxes as well as some diagrams with noise on it. Basically, you have to erase all of the noise that isn't coloured in on the diagram in the same layout as it's shown on the paper. You do this which gives you access to a key pin which can take you over to the area on the right where you have to do basically the same thing a couple times over again. Once you've finished opening up all of the boxes, you notice a few flowers and notes by the side of the road, and B explains it's actually where both he and Rhyme died. Basically, they got run over by a car, and Beat wasn't fast enough to push Rhyme out of the way before it hit them. He also talks about how he'll never know if Rhyme will hold Beat accountable, since she couldn't remember a thing about Beat when they arrived in the UG. Anyway, you go and head over to Toa Records, where you don't find Carrier, and when you try scanning, you find out that you can't actually scan anyone at all. Neku believes it's due to the red skull pins that everyone's wearing, and it could be blocking the signal. Anyway, Carrier finally decides to show up and the battle initiates. Although harder than Azuki was, it's still pretty easy to spam attacks in this battle, and I was done with it pretty quickly. Azuki also decides to show up just after you finish fighting, and join in for one last battle against Neku and Beat. This battle's also pretty easy, since the game only sets one Reaper at a time on you instead of both simultaneously. So, once you finish fighting for what seems like the billionth time, they give in and give Beat Rhyme back or at least what they think is Rhyme, because it actually turns out to be a fake that Konishi gave to Uzuki over the ruse of it being the real pin. As compensation for the fake, Carrier gives you a level 4 key pin, which basically gives you access to everything, and then you get back to your original mission of finding the GM. You also get a sneak peek at Minamoto and... Sorry, Minamoto? How's he even still alive? Right, so ignoring the obvious plot point that I just skipped over, we end up at day 5 and Beat's busy having a panic attack. Anyway, you head over to Udagawa, since that's where Carrier's key can open, and I couldn't help but notice that literally everyone is saying the exact same thing. The Reapers, the RG people, it's all just... To right the countless wrongs of our day, we shine the light of true redemption, that this place may become as paradise. Yes, it makes absolutely no sense, but let's be honest, making no sense is probably what this game does best. So you head over to Udagawa, but you don't actually have to use the keep-in because there's already a massive hole in the wall. Bit suspicious, but there's not much else that you can do than move forward. There's also a bunch of burn marks on the floor where the taboo noise sigil was the week before, and Neku decides to use the camera on the phone to check what was here in the past. Now, unexpectedly, it actually shows Mr. H himself on the floor next to the sigil, so they decide to play his cafe a visit. On the way there, they also get approached by Kuria and Uzuki, who are also saying the same thing as everyone else, and you have to fight them, which basically works the same as you did last time you have to in the battle, so I won't go into the details. What's worse, though, is that after that battle, another day passes and you're back at the scramble again. So you dash to Cat Street, and the same break in the wall that was in Udagawa is also here. Of course, this sends Beat to believe that it was actually Mr. Hanakoma who caused all of this, but I doubt that's actually the case, him being the chad he is. So you head over to the cafe, and when you get there, it's completely trashed, with no sight of Hanakoma at all. So Neku decides to use his camera to find out what happened, but Beat takes it before Neku can use it at all, and immediately uses up all of his three uses for the day. Luckily, the camera takes a picture of Mr. Hanakoma hiding something in the wall, so Neku and Beat have a look where he was standing. 
And sure enough, there's a brand new keep in that can only open up the one place Beat wanted to go the whole time, the Shibuya River. Now this makes Neku pretty suspicious of Hanakoma, and if he's actually the composer. You see, since Mr. H is the cat designer guy, and the player pin as well as the red pin has the cat design on it, it's pretty easy to assume that he might be the composer himself. So you start heading towards the station underpass when you see something. Zeta concerning on the road, one Minamoto garbage heap, and of course where a heap is, a heaper isn't that far behind. Uh. That's a quote, I think. Anyway, he goes on to explain how, although the attack he performed on us last week erased him, he was reincarnated due to the taboo sigil in Udagawa, and he became a literal taboo noise himself. And with this, he initiates possibly the most annoying battle in the game's existence. Not because he deals any real damage, because he really doesn't, but because it's borderline impossible to attack him at all because he keep, just keeps teleporting around the stage. This basically means that you just have to keep chipping away at him for what was probably the longest four minutes of my life. The constant Zeta slows and you're out of your vectors throughout the battle didn't help either. Zeta slow! Zeta slow! You're out of your vector! Zeta. Anyway, once you finish the battle, he runs off to find the composer, because for some reason literally everyone wants to overthrow him, the day ends, and with that it's the last day of the game. So, since Beat kinda reached his Reaper cell by date yesterday, his hands are back to the future style fading away, and they hurry over to the Shibuya River. However, they find the wall blocking the river was already broken down, presumably due to Minamoto. Speaking of Minamoto, he's already inside, but he can't break through a wall that Konishi put up. He also tells the two that Konishi isn't through the wall, but in fact she was hiding in Beat's shadow the whole time, chasing your shadow much. Anyway, Konishi opens the wall up for Minamoto, and he heads on forward, leaving you in a battle for Rhyme with the GM. Now, basically how this battle works is there's some black hole thing in the corner of the stage, and you have to send taboo noise over the black hole, and erase normal noise before they reach it. This phase is pretty easy, and so is the next one, where you basically just have to attack the yellow Konishi. The next phase, however, is where the flaws of this game edition start to show. Actually, now's a good time to talk about the original battle system. So in the DS version of the game, instead of Neku and his partners sharing one screen, they're divided between two screens, with you using the touchscreen to control Neku, and the D-pad to control your partner. This was actually the way I completed the game the second time I played it, and for the most part, it's a lot harder. You see, you constantly have to pay attention to both battles at the same time, and although you can put your partner into auto mode, they're still quite vulnerable to attack. In battles like these, however, it's very clear that it was originally for the DS, and the way they've ported it over is actually a lot harder. So basically, Neku has to run around and avoid the, the yellow Konishis while Speed attacks the fake Konishis. Simple, right? Absolutely not, because Konishi just does not stop attacking you. They're not even very powerful, it's just that she does it so much it's impossible to avoid. I actually ended up doing this battle on easy mode, which I didn't do for any other battle, because it was basically impossible to do any real damage during this phase otherwise. So, when you deal enough damage to Konishi, you get access to the Rhyme Pin, which you aren't told how to use, but through a bit of trial and error you can get it and complete the boss battle. We also get told by Konishi that Rhyme's memories of Beat were actually Beat's entry fee instead of Rhyme's. We're, we're never actually told what Rhyme's is, but at least you're able to head on to the next room. While walking through the next room, Shiki of all people shows up behind you and you have to fill in her about what happened. You also find another of the Zeta junk heaps with Minamoto himself passed out under it. You do manage to collect his cap, however, which is probably the most OP item in the game. Anyway, you make it to the Reaper bar that you've seen so many times in cutscenes, and Kitaniji is waiting there for you. He also does some weird hypnosis thing to Shiki which makes her attack against you, as well as Kitaniji. Luckily, the battle isn't too hard since Kitaniji and Shiki's attacks are pretty avoidable. Anyway, after the battle, you break the red skull pin that Shiki has on, which takes her out of the trance. However, Beat and Shiki are both fainted on the floor at this point, which means you have to go alone to fight the composer. Anyway, he makes it to the composer's room, and at this point he's convinced it's Mr. H. However, Kitaniji very quickly shows up and tells Neku that Hanakoma isn't actually the composer, and the composer actually hasn't been here at all during his time in the UG. He also goes on to say that he was the one responsible for the skull pins that made everyone repeat that weird thing about paradise. He also says that the playing pin actually neutralises the effect of the skull pin, so he squashes the one that Neku had. However, this doesn't do anything, so he mutters something about not being able to harm his pick, then Beat and Shiki show up and yet another boss battle occurs. The battle works the same as basically any other in the game, besides the fact that you're, instead of fighting frogs or a crazy maths man, you're literally fighting a dragon. Now you actually have to do this battle twice, once with Shiki and again with Beat, but luckily the battle's not the hardest thing on earth, so it's pretty easy to get it done. Once you've finished fighting Dragon Kitaniji, he mutters about fighting a bit more, and then you hear a very familiar voice off to the side. Yeah, Joshua's back for some reason, and then forms some Ultra Dragon with Kitaniji for one final boss battle. Why? Absolutely no idea. 
So this battle is basically the last one, but with 5 times the fireballs, 5 times the dragon heads, and 5 times the confusion. Partway through the battle, the game also gives you the opportunity to sync with your partner by performing the sync move from their weak, first with Shiki, then Beat, then finally with Josh, to score some extra damage points. Anyway, once you finish with the battle, you press one final pin in the centre of the screen to finish the game off. Of course, there's still the question of what on earth just happened, which we soon find out. Turns out, Kitaniji had a timer on his hand the whole time, same as a player with a mere two minutes left. We soon realise why, as a clip plays of the composer planning to end Shibuya, and Kitaniji convincing him to let him try and fix it. Wait, the composer can just end a city like a TV show or something? Well, in that case... The composer also decides to handicap himself to give Kitaniji a chance at winning, by retreating to the RG and picking a player to represent him, and of course the player just happens to be the one Neku Sakuraba. And the composer just happened to be Joshua, because of course he is. I mean, it kind of makes sense what with his god complex and everything. In addition, Neku was literally playing for Shibuya to be erased without knowing at all. He also does the complimentary flashback to Neku's death you've seen so many times before, although this time it's actually the full truth. Turns out that Neku was actually caught in the middle of a chase between Josh and Minamimoto, and once Minamimoto gave up, Josh spotted Neku and, well, helped himself. After, you know, he also gave Neku an extra player pin, which is the reason why Kitaniji's breaking of the pin didn't work previously. Anyway, we get sent back to the present, where Josh challenges us to a real Hamilton-style duel, where the winner becomes composer and can choose what he wants to do with Shibuya. However, Neku can't just bring himself to shoot Josh, so he falters, and the same thing that happened three weeks ago happens now. But Neku lives. Josh has a change of heart, decides not to erase Shibuya, and brings Neku back into the RG after three weeks of being in the game. So we fast forward a week and Neku gives us some commentary into all his life in the game. In the credits, we also get pictures of the grand reunion between Neku beat Rhyme, who's alive again, and at the very end, the real Shiki, as well as Neku finally taking off his headphones. Of course, there's also still a bunch of plot holes unanswered for, but I think the story is already convoluted enough to add more to. Honestly, this game turns out to be a lot more than I expected to when I first picked it up, and it still surprised me after I finished. You see, after completing the story, you can go back to any day of the week through the chapters menu, Furthermore, there's an entirely new day that you unlock once finishing the story, but this video is already longer than all of my others combined and I need sleep, so let's go straight to another round of 5 things I like about this game. Number 1. I briefly touched on this already, but the video game soundtrack in this is absolutely phenomenal, and it's a bit unfair to even call it video game music since it sounds like genuinely something that would come out at that time period. I'm not actually listening to it by the way, I don't own the CD. Number two, the story is also really great and something you can put some true investment into, and for all of the English teachers out there, it's also an extended metaphor for like opening yourself up and like learning to trust people. Number three, the characters are also really well written and come across in the way they should. For example, Josh comes across in the sort of way that I want to dip into a bowl of molten lava. Number four, Mr. Hanakoma. Number five, the way you collect pins in the game really has a sense of progression with leveling up and pins evolving. However, there are some things that aren't quite as progressive, such as... <sighs> Number one, the sheer amount of unanswered questions you have at the end of the game. Like, there are so many plot holes and stories within itself, it's hard to keep track, especially at the end of the game when everything comes to a close. Like, I guess there are the secret reports by Mr. Hanakoma, but I'd rather have, like, the answers within the game instead of just, like, a word document you can unlock later. Number two. Now this one's directed in particular towards the final remix Switch port, and it's mainly due to how the game controls with motion controls. Now I knew they couldn't do too much in the way of it since the game natively works by using a touchscreen, but they could have at least tried to make it a lot more fluid, because in my opinion it works a lot better on the touchscreen. And that's basically all from my point of view that's wrong with this game. I know some people dislike the way of battling all around, but personally I think it's quite fun and inventive, and definitely beats the turn-by-turn -turn battling you see in so many RPGs. Anyway, that's it. In my opinion, the game's definitely a must-try, and despite the flaws that the Switch port may have, I'm glad it's available for more people to pick up and play. And to finish off, I think there's only one thing left to do. So, just got this in the mail, looks pretty important, should probably open it up. Right. Dear That Dari B, we've heard that you're now a weeb.
Zozetta Slow.